Uh, my name is Luke Cornell, by the way. I work here at Emily Carr. You've probably seen me around. Um, okay, Sonny Asu. Um, he is um, uh, Laquetta from the Wee Kai First Nations. He graduated here from Emily Carr. He received, his B he received the BC Creative Achievement Award in First Nations Art in 2011 and was long listed for the 10th Annual Sobe Award in 2012. His work has been featured in several solo and group exhibitions over the past years. Most notably, Don't Stop Me Now and Comic Relief at the National Gallery of Canada, Beat Nation and How Soon Is Now at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and Changing Hands, Art with Reservation Part 2 at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City. His work has been accepted into the National Gallery of Canada, the Seattle Art Museum, and the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. His work is conceptually and aesthetically designed to challenge the authenticity of Indigenous art while simultaneously reflecting upon our Western civilization's consumption of culture. He is currently living and working out of Montreal. Ladies and gentlemen, Sonia Su. Thanks, everybody. I gotta use a microphone. I feel like a big rap star right now. I'm not gonna rap. I'm not gonna do that. That's just gonna be really embarrassing for everybody in the room. Is this thing on? Can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna cue up the uh, the audio, the visual guy. Yay, there I am. So uh, yes, thank you for having me, Brenda. Thank you for bringing me in. Thank you, Emily Carr, for hosting this event. Uh, I'm really excited to be sharing my work with you um, around the reconciliation conferences here in Vancouver. Um, I, I'm really proud to be an Emily Carr graduate. I graduated in 2002, and uh, I was just thinking about this today. Um, all my friends, all the staff, all the instructors that I've had here, um, you've helped me become who I am today, and I really want to thank you for that. So um, Emily Carr has probably been the best experience of my life, and it's, uh, it's stuck with me forever, and um, you're part of my family, so thank you for having me back. <clears throat> So I'm going to show you uh, my pretty much my entire body of work over the past 11 years. We've got an hour to get through it all, so I might blast through some of the earlier stuff um, and then focus on some of the newer stuff I've been working on uh, most recently. Um, but basically, I'll just start off and uh, tell a little story about myself and pop cultural influences. Uh, basically, my work is uh, very autobiographical in nature, and it started off by exploring who I am as a Liquita person, and who I am as a child of pop culture, growing up in the, the pinnacle of 80s pop culture, um, and really trying to discover who I was. And when I was in my final year here at Emily Carr, I was really trying to challenge the stereotype of what it was like to be, to be an Indigenous person and to be an Indigenous artist working in this super strong discourse here in Vancouver around Northwest Coast art. Um, and the work that I was doing at the time, I, I didn't really feel like it really challenged my own self-perception of really making something uniquely my own. And I just started one day just thinking about my work and thinking about young Sonny, like why I got involved in art in the first place, and thinking about how I used to love comic books and how television and movies and radio and media influenced me um, as a child. And it really started to, to peak in my mind about this one specific story that I had um, when I was going to school in grade three. Um, I moved into Vancouver with my mother, um, and I was going to a school there, of course, as a kid. And um, my teacher at the time was, was, was teaching the class, teaching me about my own people. He was teaching me about the Kwakwakiwa people, back then referred to the Kwakutl. And I don't know, maybe this didn't dawn on me, maybe my mom can answer the question later on about why Sonny didn't know he was an Indian. Um, but <laughs> but I, I didn't know, and it was funny because the, the teacher was talking about these people in the past tense. These people used to live in this area where I spent my summers. These people ate the food that I ate on a daily basis, salmon, oolikins, all that stuff. And these people made this iconic artwork um, at the time, my mom was married to a, a carver, Jerry Smith, an artist, Northwest Coast artist, and he's making this work. And so I started drawing all these connections. I'm like, I spend my summer there. I, I eat that food. That's the stuff that Jerry makes. Like, what is this all about? And I remember running home, and my mom probably was lying on the couch after a long day's hard work. I came in, kicked off my shoes, looking for my mom. Mom, mom, mom. 
I got this cool stuff to tell you. I got this cool stuff to tell you. And I told her about all this stuff I learned about these people in the past, their artwork, their food. They eat the same food that we do. We, they live in the area where we, we spend our summers. They, the, the stuff they make is what Jerry makes. And she just looked up at me and says, well, that's who you are. So I'm going to ask you later why I didn't know. <laughs> and so basically, I took that story and that, that kind of time frame in my life and thought about how media and pop culture influenced me. And I came up with a series called the Challenging Tradition Series. And this was really just about exploring who I was as a Likwetak Kwakwakiwak person, um, but also being a child of pop culture and what influenced me. What influenced me um, was mass media, advertising, um, comic books, movies. So from the Challenging Tradition series, we got you know, the iconic guys of Spider-Man, Hulk, Mickey Mouse, uh, another Hulk, and uh, Rez Pez. And that really kind of spurred on this kind of creative notion to start understanding who I was as an individual in this world. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead a number of years to 2006 when I made the Breakfast series. And this was done um, for a show, my first solo exhibit in Vancouver, um, called Sunny S2 is Defined by the Indian Act, a little tongue-in-cheek title. Um, and again, I just started thinking about you know, my childhood, my past, how I was just enveloped in this notion of pop culture, where pop culture and media and advertising was bombarding me on a daily basis. Buy this stuff, buy these toys, eat this food. And I started really thinking about it, about well, this, this becomes my, my heritage, my traditional heritage. This is what makes up me as an individual. Um, this media that we live in influences my life as much as my traditional culture does. Um, and so I made the breakfast series to kind of reflect a number of different issues that I was, I was thinking about at the time. And when I, when I made this work, and pretty much the work that I was doing at the time and the work that I do now, um, I make it from a very kind of just uh, quick response to a, to a thought that I've had in my head. I, I, I bring the concept into my work at a later time. Um, and so the concept for this work came a little bit later, but this is really just kind of exploring the notion of who I was through a very humorous way. What I discovered when I started thinking about this in a humorous way and then inserting issues of colonization, loss of food, loss of land resources, and loss of identity, I was able to approach it in such a way that I was introducing humor to the conversation. Where there's, when I was kind of, when I first started going to Emily Carr and, and, and exploring my culture through the diverse community that was here, um, a lot of the artists that I was looking at and referencing um, were from a very angry Indian discourse. And for me, that was, I wasn't really, I didn't really felt the need or the, the understanding that I, that I had to hold on to that anger um, because I wasn't really directed, directly influenced by the notions that they were getting at, but I understood their reasoning as why they were angry and why they were ranting and why they were berating through their work uh, very powerfully. Um, but I didn't feel I had the right to, to be that angry. So I felt that humor was the best way to get people involved into the issues. Um, and just, uh, oh, sorry, wrong one. I thought I had another slide in there. Um, but just, you know, talking about this piece, is, you know, we got Lucky Beads, um, which is kind of exploring this notion of stereotype that Manhattan was sold for a handful of shiny beads to the Indians. Um, you know, being funny, Kwakwakiwak Bannock Pops, um, Kwakwakiwak Treaty Flakes, Potlatch Salmon Crisp. Uh, potlatch, uh, sorry, Kwakwakiwak salmon loops. And what I found interesting over the years is and what I really found interesting about my work in general and how people approach it is that I have a base understanding of what, why what my work is, um, but people always bring something unique and interesting to the conversation no matter where they're from. Um, so I really appreciate when people come up to me and say, you know, Sonny, you know, you made this work in 2006, but it, it's resonating to me today in 2013 about the loss of the salmon coming into the Fraser River. Um, so I just, I, just, I just like how this work has been able to transcend um, over the years and influence a lot of people. This is uh, Coke Salish I did in 2006 as well for um, my show at the Belkin Satellite Gallery. And I want to start off by thanking the Coke Salish people for, for allowing me to live in their territory. And this is what this piece was really... Um, was really made for was to pay um, to pay respect to the Coast Salish nations in Vancouver um, for allowing all of us through colonization um, to live in their traditional territories. <clears throat> and I came up with the idea for the piece. I think it was in 2003 when uh, Vancouver was awarded the uh, 2010 Winter Games. What I found interesting was that the games were being marketed as Canada 
the world coming to Canada, coming to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. But they weren't really honoring or recognizing the traditional ter territories of the First Nations people that were here. And then thinking about it in the terms of, of pop culture and media and advertising and how I've been influenced by that, I made this piece to kind of subvert that notion of the welcoming of, of the people. And then going on through this piece and presenting it in various formats, what I found interesting, and even with the cereal boxes, is that it became invisible to people in a way, like this image became invisible to people, which I found really interesting because as, as an artist, you don't want to be invisible. You want people to see your work, you want people to know who you are and have a conversation with you. And it kind of came out of this, this, this notion of the invisible notion behind these works came out of uh, a quick little anecdote that I was, uh, an interaction I was having with um, a security guard at the Museum of Anthropology. He was walking me down um, to the area where I was gonna be giving a presentation and uh, he said, hey, Sonny, I really love your work. It's really smart. It's really funny. Um, but can you do me a favor? And I'm like, oh, OK, security guard. I'll do you a favor. Um, and he's like, yeah, can you, uh, can you just make some kind of like little panel, some little text information about this piece? Because I'm really tired of all these tourists coming up to me and going, where's the Coke machine? Where's the hot dog cart? I went up to the Coke sign, and there's no Coke machine. There's no, there's no cafeteria. And so it's interesting how people just kind of glance over this stuff because it does mirror and mimic the piece that I'm appropriating so perfectly that people just don't recognize it. Um, another anecdote from, from this specific piece, I don't know if she's in the room. Penny, are you in the room? Penny? No? Um, she, uh, she was at the World Urban Forum with her partner, Tim, uh, a couple years ago where we did this piece really large um, when in 2007 or 2006. So when you walked out of the forum, you were seeing this giant Coast Salish sign, Coca-Cola sign, and you were acknowledging that you were still in Coast Salish territory and entering back into it. Um, and she looked up, at, and I heard this story from her secondhand, and she looked up at the sign and she got mad. And she was telling me, Sonny, I got so mad, I was getting mad. Tim was like starting to get a little bit embarrassed and he's like, you know, can you just calm down a bit and then take a look at the sign? Just take it in for a second. And she looked at it and she goes, oh, Sonny. This is iPotlatch uh, version one, again from 2006 for my first solo show. Uh, it's 5,000 ancestors in your pocket. <laughs> and again, like I, I, I really wanted to approach my work from this, this area of humor and just really kind of talk about, and not even really, it was just me being fun. I was just having a lot of fun with this work. And you know, this, this was very kind of um, at an early stage in my career. Um, and I was just really exploring uh, my, my, my career and the work that I wanted to make. Uh, for me, I was really starting to explore this notion of totemic representation. What makes up our clan-based structure? From a traditional standpoint, um, you know, it's the raven, the bear, the salmon, the eagle, whatever it may be. Um, but in our today's modern technology-based society, uh, we don't really recognize that. We are the iPod clan, the Blackberry clan, the Android clan. And this really came about from having an observation on the bus one day. I don't know where I was going. Um, but I was just on the bus, standing there, and I watched these two people come on the bus um, at the height of iPod's fame. Um, and we really started taking off. And they had their little white earbuds in. And they were scrolling through their list of songs. Um, they sat down next to each other. They didn't interact with each other at all. I'm not too sure if they knew each other or not. Um, but I found it really interesting through that observation that they were connected, even though they were ignoring each other. And that's essentially what Steve Jobs is really trying to do with this piece, is like, we're trying to connect the world to this technology. But what I've noticed, and what a lot of people have noticed over the years, is that this technology really kind of puts us in our own little bubble. We're constantly like this, and even, even more so today. You know, we're always constantly like this on our phones, we're kind of ignoring everything around us, we put our earbuds in, and we just ignore the world. And so that's why I kind of started thinking about this theory of, you know, this becomes our new personal totems. We are the iPod clan, the Blackberry clan, and all kind of stuff. <clears throat> this is some more work from this series. This is Ihamatsa, iPodlatch Ego in the center, and Ihamatsa Dancer over on the side. And through that, through these pieces, with that kind of notion in mind about these technologies as new personal totems, I started thinking about what would a traditional dancer do um, in the future to ready himself for a potlatch. 
Um, and I started kind of painting these imageries of um, a Hamatsa dancer on either sides, um, embracing this notion of technology to ready themselves for a potlatch. Or maybe even in the future, we're going to have potlatches in our own heads. You know, we're going to be just plugged into these machines, and we're just going to plug in our earbuds, and we're going to dance in a room. Maybe it's going to be virtual. Who knows? Um, but that's what I was just really kind of stipulating with these pieces. And painting myself in the last two as the, as the self portraits was just me really kind of situating myself in the middle of this kind of technology culture. And I am such a techno person. I, I love collecting all these gadgets. And I am super immersed in this technology. And it's been interesting, because over the past, um, probably the past month, if anyone follows me on Facebook, you know I've, I've removed everything. And I'm trying to get myself off this stuff. But it's so hard, because I'm, I'm living in Montreal now. And it's, you know, it's, it's a really good tool to be connected to the people that you love and you care about, especially when you have such great distances between you. So it's interesting to find a balance between um, being on the grid and wanting to be off the grid. This is the iPod ver uh, version 2. It's actually called 10,000 Ancestors in Your Pocket. And this was done um, in 2009 for a show called Continuum at the Bill Reed Gallery um, downtown. And they approached me and they said, you know, we're having a show called Continuum and we're really trying to approach traditional Northwest Coast artists who are working in traditional mindsets, and we want to kind of help them think outside the box. Um, we recognize that you are thinking completely outside the box with your work, and we just want you to be in the show as an inspiration to them. Um, and it was a really, a really great show to be in because it also challenged me to think about my work in a very different scale. Um, this piece is uh, three foot by six foot. I actually painted this in a five foot by four foot room. <laughs> it was, uh, and I, I lost my studio at one point, and uh, I moved back into my, I moved my studio back into my house, and it was just like a, essentially a walk-in closet. So I was able, only able to paint this thing up or down, and I wasn't really to step, able to step back and look at it. Um, but it's, this is one of the pieces that I really kind of see myself embracing this notion of abstraction through my work. And I'm going to talk a bit more about abstraction later on. Um, but this is a, a very kind of abstract piece for me. Um, at the time, I was painting some drums, and I'm going to show you those in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and they, they were fairly, and my, my work is fairly abstract in terms of Northwest Coast standards, um, but I was still kind of framing a lot of my stuff. Even when you think about the, the Ahamata pieces, I was still kind of framing it in a very kind of narrative way. I was thinking about my, my work in a very traditional narrative by a you know, taking stories from my culture and taking, appropriating from the general pop culture and then reforming it into my own stories. Um, so it was very kind of narrative-based and story-based. And so this piece allowed me to actually think outside that, that box and really start to think about abstraction in my work. And this is one of the first pieces that I did where I was using the headphone cord to really break up the space and to create a different layer of dynamics throughout the paintings and throughout the works. Um, the Potlatch Man. I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, from 1884 to 1951, it was illegal um, in Canada under the Indian Act, which is still an act today, for my family to practice our traditional cultures. Uh, for 67 years, it was illegal for us to practice, to sing, to dance, to have potlatches. Doing so meant you'd be thrown in jail, you could be fined, or both. Um, commonly, regalia, masks, um, dance where uh, were confiscated by the Canadian government and they've sold off to various collections around the world. Um, and this piece is an installation of 67 copper cups. They're grand day sized. Um, it, was, it was funny to, to, to make this piece and to think about it because I had these fabricated here in Vancouver um, and just thinking about it and I was, you know, I was talking to the company that was, that was making these pieces for me and I brought in this like, grand day sized Starbucks cup, paper cup. And I plopped it on the counter and I said, I want to make this in copper. And he says, why? You're going to burn your face off when you have a coffee. <laughs> and I said, no, it's not, it's not the drink, it's art. And he says, oh, OK. And he goes right out the ticket. <laughs> he wrote it, it's funny, because he's like, oh, whatever. Um, so yeah, so I have 67 copper cups uh, in installed on this kind of, on a Hudson's Bay blanket in this kind of discarded pattern. And it came out. Um, about an exploration of the potlatch ban in Canada the last 67 years. Um, and thinking about traditional notions of wealth um, from my people, and the copper shield um, was the epitome of a family's wealth or a chief's wealth. Um, and this piece, 
thinking about copper and thinking about how it juxtaposed our Western society, where our potluck society hoards wealth, keeps wealth, to give it all away at these big events. Where our Western society, what we're all living in right now, we hoard wealth, we keep wealth to buy inanimate objects, to buy condos, to buy cars, to buy iPods, to save it. And then that wealth either gets transferred to someone in their family or it just disappears when we die. Um, and so it's a dramatic difference between how a potluck society sees their wealth and how our, our Western society sees the wealth. And this notion of um, discarding really came up, and the reason I used the coffee cup, because I, I recognized when people, especially in Vancouver, because there's such a strong, large coffee consumption culture here, um, that people walk down the streets with these cups, no matter the size, no matter what's in them, these paper white cups. They're filled with, you know, there could be a $2 Americano or just a quick coffee, um, but more often than not, it's a six or seven, $8 latte, right? We're able to take these cups and we're able to walk around town showing our wealth subconsciously. You know, we'll walk around like this. This is our wealth, I'm sipping on it. But when you're finished, the cup is empty, the cup is worthless to you, it becomes garbage, it becomes recycling, so we just toss it away. So it's interesting to see how we do that in our society where we waste everything. Um, but our traditional potluck society doesn't waste a lot of things. We, we, we see our wealth in a dramatically different way. And for me, the discarding pile of these cups came about from that notion of how Canada, over the, since its colonization, um, has really treated the indigenous society. How they have just discarded my people, discarded your people, um, and just tossed our culture away through this banning, through this ban. Um, and the piece really came about uh, from hearing a story. I can't remember who was telling the story. I think it was someone in my family. <clears throat> they were talking about a chief at a potlatch. And commonly what would happen at a potlatch is the chiefs would all get together after a potlatch and essentially have a pissing contest. <laughs> it's called boasting. They say boasting. They boast. Um, and they get around, they sit around the fire, and they, you know, they sing these little songs, and they chant, and they boast, and they say, hey, I had a potlatch last year, and I gave away a bunch of stuff, and uh, this is how rich I am. And they'd break off a piece of their copper, no matter how big. Depending how big they wanted to seem how much their wealth was, they can break off a piece of copper, of their copper, and then they would offer it to the host chief. If the host chief recognized that his wealth or his potlatch, what he gave away, because that's the, the essence of the potlatch, the more you give away, the wealthier you are. If he recognized that he gave more away, he would have to break off a smaller piece, or he would break off a bigger piece to indicate that he gave away less. In the background, there was this one chief. He was just thinking about this, watching these two guys boast, and he just had this epiphany. I, 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 gave, I had a potlatch a couple years ago, and I gave away so much stuff. I gave away all my wealth, and it's represented to you in this copper shield. I'm going to prove my wealth to you right now by destroying my copper, and he threw it in the ocean. He said, I don't need my wealth anymore because it's just material stuff. And that's it. And so essentially that's, that's how I came to, to install these cups um, in this discarded pile to draw connections to um, that traditional story that I heard and to how Canada has treated its indigenous population um, over the times of colonization. This is the fourth install that I've done with it. And this is most recently in Sakahan, um, which is the big indigenous um, uh, exhibit at the National Gallery, National Gallery that happened this summer in Ottawa. It was 83 Indigenous artists from all over the world, which was, which was an amazing experience. I went down for the opening and I met other white Indians from all over the world. I was, I was blown away. I'm like, oh my God, you're a native too and you're from Sweden? <laughs> this is cool. Um, so I installed it for, for the installation there. And it was really powerful. It was a really powerful room. I don't, I don't know if anyone got down to go see it or not. Um, but it was installed kind of in the first, on the, it started off on the top floor. So if you walked into the top floor, this is the first room you'd walk into. And so you're greeted by my installation of cups. Along the wall on the side was Nadia Meyer's uh, Beaded Indian Act. Um, and on the other wall facing Nadia's piece and facing my piece was Lawrence Paul's shotgun, which he used to shoot the Indian Act. So it was a very, very powerful room. Anyways, when I install this work, I really want to try and install it in a new configuration every time, just to kind of challenge myself. Because every time I installed it a couple of times the exact same way, um, but I challenge myself to try and make it make these this discarded pile look like a discarded pile. It's very hard to do. <laughs> um, anyways, for this for this installation, I, I discarded it, made this big discarded pile in the center. I'm going to use this fancy laser pointer right now. And then these four guys right here. 
what I did for this installation is I was paying respect to the four founding members of the Idle No More movement, the four women who stepped up to engage Canada, um, to step up and see past the oppression that the Canadian government was putting everybody through, to challenge everybody in Canada to step up and fight for the environment, not just for Indigenous peoples, but to fight for the environment, fight for Canada's fabric as a whole. Um, so I installed these four cups that greets you when you walk in to pay respect to those four women who started that movement. Um, over the course of the couple, the last couple months, you know, there's been news and stuff that uh, the Idle No More movement has been, has now been dead. It's gone. Um, the funny thing is, is when people say that, I always like to correct them by saying, you know, the movement may be dead. This particular movement may be dead, but the, the, the indigenous resistance movement is never going to go away. Um, we're going to be fighting for a very long time till we get the rec recognition um, from the Canadian government to treat us like equal people. Because under the government, I'm not an equal person, and that's really sad. And I'm going to talk more about that later. This is the silenced series, again, dealing with um, the potlatch ban and the Indian Act. Uh, it started off with the, uh, the top one right there. Um, that was silence number one. And I was just trying to think about, because I was painting so many drums at the time, trying to really think about challenging my work and challenging my own perceptions of the work that I was doing, and this even challenging the notion of the drum, because these drums for me um, were a canvas. It was a surface for me to paint on. Um, they get collected by people, by institutions, and they'd be hung on walls. Um, and they weren't really used for their intended purpose of, of, of the drum beat and producing ceremony, producing culture. Um, so I challenged my notions of that by stacking them up and referencing the Hudson's Bay Blankets. The Hudson's Bay Blankets were used during potlatches. They were given away. Uh, they were prized for their warmth and value. Um, they were given away to people as, 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 as a gift. Because you do, if you do attend a potlatch, you do walk away with something. Um, everyone who goes through potlatch walks away with a gift. Because that's the essence of the potlatch. Um, so I started stocking these drums on the floor, painting them to look like Hudson's Bay blankets and painting the point lines on them to indicate um, the, the worth of these people through these point lines. Um, traditionally, the, the point lines on the blankets reference one, one point line equals one fur. Um, so if you go into the Hudson's Bay trading post back in the day, you bring in four beaver furs, you get one four point blanket. Um, and I stacked them up to reference the potlatch giveaway because I'd seen a number of photographs and even at the um, the Museum of Civilization, as it used to be called in Gatineau, um, they have the Northwest Coast Longhouse uh, procession on the ground floor, and there's a Kwakwakiwak house. And as soon as you walk in, you see all these artifacts that are going to be given away at a potlatch, and there's this huge wall of Hudson's Bay blankets um, that were just stacked up. And I've seen these photographs of just hundreds and thousands of bay blankets that stacked up to be given away at potlatches. And so this is what this, these pieces specifically reference. Um, so number one, two, and three across the top, uh, this one down here in the bottom corner is called Silence the Harbinger. And to me, I wanted to also reference this piece of how these blankets were used to spread smallpox and tuberculosis amongst the first peoples um, through uh, Canada's history. And these, this is a, a little known fact, and this is stuff that I, that I discovered um, through my education through Emily Carr and even through my self-education after I've left here, um, that there's a lot of hidden history in Canada that we don't learn about at various levels of our scholastic careers. And so I really wanted to bring this story to the forefront to tell people that these blankets were used to enact the genocide in Canada that we don't talk about. Um, so if you were to peel, this is called the harbinger to indicate that this, this blanket is coming to get you. Um, and the red line to me references the, the smallpox uh, infection. If you were to peel off every drum layer, you'd see this, this smallpox ovoid continue on to every, every drum. The one in the center is on number five. It's, it's one of two or three that I, that I did to kind of just abstract um, the, uh, the, the Hudson Bay iconography even further. <clears throat> and the one on the very bottom there, um, I can't remember what I called that one, but I painted that one for a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a performance artist. His name is Terrence Houle, uh, a very strong artist. He's Blackfoot. Um, he's from Calgary, Alberta. He contacted me one day, and he told me that he was, and this is just when I was just moving out to Montreal, and he said, I'm going to be going out to uh, Val d'Or to do a residency just outside Montreal, and I want, I want you to paint me a drum. I want to use your drum in a ceremony that I'm doing. And to me, that f I was really honored that Terrence would think about me in that way because my drums normally don't get played. You know, they're, they're treated as works of art and they get hung on a wall, which is great. Um, but they never get used. And so 
I was really honored that Terrence asked me to do that. And I started doing a bit of research um, into the Hudson's Bay blanket at that, at that time, and I discovered that there was a blanket that was issued to, uh, I, I don't remember what, for what reason, but it was issued um, in the royal, royal colors to pay respect to the queen. Um, and at that same time, uh, Prince Charles was adopted into Terence's Blackfoot community. And so I painted it in the royal purple colors um, with these kind of abstracted ovoids breaking up the space and the four point lines. Um, and Terence used it in his performance. He ended up giving it to his father, um, who was a traditional powwow dancer, um, which again was another just great hit to, um, to me that these, these, these things were being played and being honored and being used. And Terrence was telling me uh, a while back when I ran into him, he said, no, my dad, I gave him the drum. He loves it, but he's a little bit embarrassed to bring it out because he goes to these powwows and there's all these other guys with this, these, these little chump drums and this Terrence words, thump, trump drums. And he brings out this Cadillac of drums and he starts <laughs> playing on it. <them. laughs> so it's, it's interesting. <clears throat> this is Silence the Hidden. Again, um, stacked up drums. And these ones is an, this one is an installation of 67 stacked drums, again, to reference the Potlatch Band in Canada. Um, this one I painted tone on tone, so the kind of uh, the whitish color you're seeing here, that's actually skin tone paint, and this is actually the skin. So I have the skin um, producing itself as the negative space of the, of the ovoids and the, the abstract reform lines from the northwest coast. I installed them back into the corner because I wanted to indicate that the people were, were backed into a corner through colonization um, over the years and even still so today. And I painted them with skin tones, so, so I wanted to indicate that there's this hidden notion of, of the hidden history in Canada. Uh, and I didn't, point, I didn't paint any point lines on these drums because I wanted to indicate that the government continues to consider us worthless in terms of the eyes of the colonizer. To juxtapose that, this is Silence the Hidden. And I had these, Silence the Burning, sorry. I had these facing off. This is at the Equinox Gallery here in Vancouver. And I had these facing off against each other. So this one was in kind of almost the center of the room looking over at the other drums. And these were stacked up. And it's called Silence the Burning because this is one of the first pieces that I made to reference um, my family's history through colonization. Uh, whereas before, I was really referencing my personal history uh, I started thinking about my own personal history and what made up my history, and that's going back and doing research about my own family. I discovered that my great-great-grandfather, Chief Billy Asu, was a highly regarded chief on the northwest coast. Um, and I started doing some research into him, and he's, he's, his, his, his iconography as, as, a, as a human being has made his way into my work a number of times. And this one specifically references a story that I heard that my grandmother had told me about... Um, the, uh, around the same time, I think it was just before um, the potlatch bust in 1921 in, in Alert Bay, um, where an Indian agent approached my great-great-grandfather, Chief Billy Asu, and said, I know you're going to have a potlatch. It's legal. You're not allowed to do that. Um, so you've got two options. You can either continue on with your culture, and you could produce your potlatch, and we're going to come bust it. We're going to come confiscate all your regalia. We're going to fine you, and we'll probably throw you in jail. Or the nice guy that he was, just give me all your stuff right now and I'll walk away. <laughs> I'll let you sit with that one for a second, he, he said, <laughs> and I'll come back and we'll talk about it. So, my, so Chief Billy Asu went to his village, went to his people and said, this is what's been presented to me. This is the ultimatum that I have. Um, you know, I can, we can give up our regalia and we could just go on with our lives and we can kind of maybe try and keep our culture, continue on our grounds. Or we can continue underground in their culture anyways. We can have our potlatch. We can have our celebration. Um, but we're going to get busted. I'm going to get thrown in jail. We're all going to get fined. Um, you know, what do you want me to do? And the people said to him, just give it up. We don't need it. It's just material. We need you. You're our inspiration. We want you to stay around. With that, my great-great-grandfather dragged all his regalia down to the beach and he burnt it. Just destroyed it all. I don't need it. It's just material. I can make more. So that's Silence the Burning. This is Ellipsis and Billy and the Chiefs. This is the quick installation shot of the work. And this was inspired, this is my great-great-grandfather right here. This is Chief Billy Asu. Um, and these are the recordings that I found of him right here. Actually, my mother found these right there, my mother. 
Um, she, she was working at the treaty office one day, and um, she gets a call uh, from somebody, I don't remember who, um, and he was just thumbing through this box of records, and it said, free or trash. <clears throat> and he, found, he, found this, he finds this collection of records, and he thinks they're important. They must be important. They look old. They look interesting. Um, he did a quick search on Google, which brought him to my mother through the treaty office that she works at. And um, he called her up and said, I found these records in a free or trash bin. You know, do you guys want them? And, he, and my mom said, yes, bring them over. And I ended up getting them for myself um, to digitize and to produce copies for my community. Um, and I started thinking about these records um, as a conceptual record of the potlatch ban itself. I found it interesting that Chief Bailey Asu was allowed to enter a recording studio to sing these songs for an ethnologist, but was not allowed to leave that studio to sing those songs for himself or for his culture or for his family. And that's what Ellipsis is. This was in um, Beat Nation in 2012 here at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And it's an installation of 137 copper records um, to indicate the, the Indian Act in Canada. And the Indian Act in Canada is, I see it as apartheid, and it is apartheid. It segregates our society. It says that, you know, at one point in Canada's history, it says you can't leave the reserve. This is segregation. Um, and it is segregation. And I think about it in the ways of, you know, how we as Canada have stepped up numerous times to fight oppression around the world, but we continue to oppress our own people. Um, you know, we stepped up and said to South Africa, apartheid is wrong. But South Africa was looking at our playbook, you know. Um, you know, we stepped up to say, some people, the Canadian government supports Israel, um, but a lot of people support Palestine and Canada. Um, but they recognize that Israel has looked at our playbook and said, oh, this is good stuff. This is oppression. We can keep these people segregated. And this is essentially what the Indian Act was designed to do. And this is essentially what the, the potlatch ban was designed to do. So I, I installed this 137 copper discs in an inverted equalizer pattern to indicate the waveforms that I was listening to while I was thinking about this piece and the other piece I'm going to show you, of how even though we've been oppressed or there is oppression in our society for 137 years, our culture has continued on the ground to make sure that we sustain our way of life and to sustain our culture from across Canada. This is Billy and the Chiefs, the complete band collection, again at the Vancouver Gallery for Beat Nation in 2012. And these ones were 12-inch um, records, 12-inch drums and 10-inch drums painted to look like spinning records. And I, I grouped them all up into collections. Um, and again, this one was installed on the opposite wall of ellipsis, uh, installed in a, 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 the correct way up for an equalizer pattern to indicate that we are strong and that we are, we are keeping on. Uh, and 67, again, references the potlatch ban in Canada. And these are the individual collections. The one on the top here, Bill and the Chiefs, that was um, the first one that I did just to give it a bit of a test to see how it was going to work in terms of the painting and what I was going to do with it. And then I started making all these little collections of these, of these drums, these sessions, that, as, I, as I was calling them. And I was recognizing because one of my favorite bands, uh, The Porcupine Tree, uh, which my buddy Jeff got me into. I don't know if he's in the room or not. Um, but they record all their, all their music in these sessions. They just sit in this studio for how many days and they make all these, these recordings of their work. And I found that really inspirational that they just go, they sit, they lock themselves away and they just make all this work. And so when I was making this work and I painted all these drums, 67 drums in 20 days, which was just nuts. Um, they, uh, cause I was living in Montreal I had to get the drums made out here. Um, they were shipped across the country. I had to let them warm up because they got cold. And then I had 20 days to paint them and then send them back out again. <laughs> um, so I just locked myself in my studio on these little painting sessions. And that's how I ended up titling these works in these various different sessions. So we got the Raven recordings, the sessions for lovers and fighters, the Indian agent sessions and other underground hits, uh, the feast collection, live from the latch, the Medicine Woman APs pays respect to the only woman singing on the recordings, the Indian Giver recordings, and the Undersea Sessions. And when I was painting these works and I was thinking about titles, because as, as I was making these, I was really trying to figure out, even just in the, 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 the titles of the specific sessions themselves, I was trying to think about, you know, what am I going to call this, this, this piece in general, this series in general? Um, and I started thinking about it in terms of, well, you know, what if my great-great-grandfather was like, 
big band player or something, or like a, a rockabilly star, and he was, um, you know, he had a really cool band, what would it be called? And I thought, oh, Billy and the Chiefs, that sounds kind of 50s-ish, kind of 40s-ish, so this is Billy and the Chiefs. <clears throat> this is the poster that I did for uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery for their fundraising initiatives. It's called Live from the Latch, um, and it's um, presented to you in a copper shape. Um, to reference the chief's copper, and you would break off a piece of your, of your copper to be emitted into the, into the uh, potlatch. Um, and this is a piece um, for the Strict Law Tour in 1921, um, the winter potlatch in Village Island, and this is the potlatch that was busted in 1921. So this is the famous potlatch bust um, from Alert Bay. Um, and it's Billing and Chiefs, the headlining tour, banned by the Canadian government, Strict Law Tour, 1921, featuring We Must Dance. And I, I kind of, and this is me being funny, but you know, there's this, unwritten rule within the potlatch society, to the, within the Lee Quartoc 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 people, that it is within our, our fabric of being that, being that we have to dance, that we have to perform our culture, that we have to live our culture. And as a little side note to that, like I've, I was playing my daughter, who's 17 months, just these drumming songs, and she just started bopping. You know, I don't know if that's just the baby thing, but just to see her just reach in and take that, that traditional music and just be inspired by it was really really cool, and it really kind of made me think about how we are, through our polished society, ingrained in us to, to dance and perform our culture. Anyways, also featuring the Quack Sisters, which is a play on words for two reasons, the Quack 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 people, but also there's a family from uh, the Campbell River, Cape Majeria, called the Quack Sisters. And I, sh I show this piece to my grandmother, and uh, she's reading it, and she's got her glasses on, and she gets the Quack Sisters, and she just laughs her ass off. It was just funny to see her do that. Um, also, uh, appearances by the War Canoes and the Hamatsa and special guests. If you attend this, there's door prizes, names, Hudson's Bay blankets, feasts, all ages. Um, and I did this uh, on the, I sketched it out first and brought it into my computer and digitized it and have it printed. Um, when I first finished it, it was just like your standard print, so you didn't have all these kind of jagged edges and stuff. But what I thought about is I really wanted to make it look like this is a found object from that era um, that could be seen in an anthropology museum. Um, and through the course of the past year, um, the MOA has acquired it for their own collection. So I believe it's, it's up in their, in their Quack 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 display case right now, which was pretty fun and pretty funny. <clears throat> Recreating language and identity. Um, and this kind of started off through a series of paintings that I started in 2009 called the Longhouse uh, series. And at first, I was just really embracing this notion of abstraction that I was talking about earlier. And I started thinking about it in terms of the abstraction of abstraction. Because I recognized that movements like the Surrealists and the Cubists were looking at Northwest Coast and indigenous cultures from all over the world and being inspired by it and using it for their own purposes to create their own artwork. So I kind of turned a lens around on it. I saw that they were looking at me and my culture, and I started looking back at them and their culture and being inspired by it. And that's how I came up with this kind of terminology called the abstraction of abstraction. Uh, the one on the bottom is called Ovoid as Language. And my good friend Dana Warren, who's now the curator of the Urban Shaman Gallery in, in, in Winnipeg, um, came by the studio one day to take a look at what I was working on and talk about the show that we were going to be doing together. And the first thing she said, and I never, this never really dawned on me until she said it, but she walked in and she saw this painting at this stage and it was finished. Um, and she said, that's cool, that looks like graffiti. And I said, yeah, you know, that does, that's interesting. I never thought about that before, but you're right, it does look like graffiti. And so I started thinking about it in terms of graffiti as a language and graffiti as a culture itself, and started playing with all these different layers and levels um, within the surface itself and started thinking about language and the recreational language and how my culture's language is only 13 fluent speakers left out of a thousand people in our, in our nation all together, all three nations together, there's about a thousand people. And there's only 13 or 14 fluent speakers left alive and they're pretty much all elders. So at any point in time, you know, we can lose that language fully. And so I started thinking about, you know, what would happen if we weren't colonized? Where would have our culture had gone? Where would have had it developed to? Um, because there's always this conception or misconception or stereotype that um, indigenous cultures in North America didn't have a written form of communication. But I started thinking, I can read a totem pole. I can read that mask. I can tell you what that mask is. I can tell you what the totem pole says. It is a language to me. And so I started thinking about it in terms of language. And so that's why I call the top one dialect. 
in the top one here is called phonology. And this one I was really, and at this time when I was painting this, these specific series of work and these specific bodies of work, I was acting very intuitively when I was painting. I, was just, I had these big ovoid templates and I just plopped them down, traced them out, um, and then filled them in with the color. And then specifically for phonology, I kind of laid out these big spaces and these big shapes. And then kind of the, uh, the other kind of wiggly bits here, I started being very intuitive with these brush strokes and I just, I didn't have any layout at all. I just went to town and started painting these lines. And I was very conscious of thinking about when I painted these lines of Asian character writing and Egyptian hieroglyphics. And I kind of started stipulating in my mind that I think that the ovoid patterns themselves could have developed into a form of written communication to communicate and to be written communication, much like character writing. The piece on the bottom is called Spont. <clears throat> and that one was painted to, uh, as a response to the 2009 sockeye run that was going into the Fraser River. Um, the government scientists at the time uh, were predicting 16 million salmon sockeye would be coming back into the river to spawn. Um, but through some twist of fate, of science, of nature, 1.6 million sockeye returned to the river, um, which was a dramatic loss. Um, it made me, it made my heart sink because this is a food source from, from my people, but not only my people, but all Northwest Coast peoples depend heavily on the salmon. And I started, it, just, it really hit me that I really, I really wanted to, to think about this. And, and I painted this painting called Spawn in the Spawn salmon colors. Um, but the year later, in 2010, they returned. They were predicting, the government scientists were predicting 1.6 million sockeye would come back to the Fraser River, but 16 million showed up. So maybe they got the papers wrong that year, I don't really know. <laughs> and my, my uncles talk about it like the, the scientists really don't know <laughs> anything about the salmon. Um, but so yeah, anyways, um, 16 million sockeye came back that year and everyone was all excited and happy and my, everyone in my family. And this is, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a contentious issue because I see that we are wiping out this species. Um, we are bringing them to near extinction levels, and uh, it's hard for me to say that because I spent my, my, my later teen lives as a fisherman. I spent my life on a fishing boat, um, and I see how um, the sockeye and the salmon have um, helped produce my culture and produce my family and make sure that we, we're, we're living. Um, so it's very hard for me to criticize and, and say extinction, um, but I think it needs to be said so we know, so we can try and figure out how to preserve it. So this piece was painted in response to the return um, to indicate that the salmon have come back, uh, but we need to be uh, wary of it and not, not overfish the population. <clears throat> this one's called Neon Supper Club with the hashtag. Um, and this one was painted in response, and this was the last longhouse that I've done uh, thus far. I've been working on one in the studio. I'm not quite finished, so I'm not gonna show it to you. Um, but this is the last one I've done thus far. It's called Neon Supper Club, and it does pay respect to um, Vancouver's former um, title of being the neon capital of the world. <laughs> At one point there was more neon here than there was in, in Las Vegas. Um, and I saw all these photographs from Fred Herzog of Vancouver in its heyday. And I started seeing all these photographs of my grandparents um, coming down to the big city to practice these kind of new cultural traditions of going to these supper clubs. So I have all these photographs of my of my grandparents and aunts and uncles in these supper clubs is partaking in the, the, the kind of colonial society at the height of the potlatch ban. So what I found interesting was that my family and my grandparents weren't allowed to practice our traditional culture, but they were allowed to practice the colonial culture. And that's what this piece um, really references. Social media influences. Again, there's my great-great-grandfather, Chief Billy Asu. And I, I forgot to put photos in here, but I got to try on his blanket. And it's at the, the Museum of Civilization in, in Gatineau. Um, my Auntie Mitzi um, told me uh, when I, I was going out there for something. I don't remember what I was going out there for. I might have been going out there for a jury or an art show or something. Um, and my Auntie Mitzi said to me, well, you know your, your great-great-grandfather's regalia is at the Museum of Man. That's what she called it, because that's what it was called at the time when she knew it. And I said, no, I, I had no clue. He said, well, I'll write you a letter, and you could try it on. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so I took my letter, <laughs> I emailed the lady first, and I said, hey, my name's Sunny Asu, my great-great-grandfather's regalia is in the collection, my Auntie Mitzi gave me a letter, <laughs> I want to come <laughs> try it. And she's so sweet, she's so cute, she's 92, she's this tiny, tiny person. And uh, she's, you know, she gave me this letter, and I went there, and um, they brought out the regalia, they brought out the blanket, the Chilkat blanket, um, they brought out the, um, the, the frontlet, which has these amazing, beautiful ermine skins on the back. Um, and they brought out the dance apron and the, the, the leggings. Um, I was only allowed to try on the blanket because I'd probably break everything else because I'm so huge. <laughs> um, but I found out my, my great-great-grandfather was actually a very, a very big man in stature as well. Anyways, when I put this blanket on, and it was funny because the, the, um, the conservators um, at the museum, they're wearing the right gloves and I'm just touching this thing with my hands. <laughs> and uh, they're picking it up and they're looking at me, they're looking at the blanket, they're looking at me, they go, are you sure? Like can, are we actually allowed to put this on you? I'm like, yeah, it's, you got a letter. It's from my auntie, Mitzi. She's <laughs> 92. Well, come on, you can do this. <laughs> and so they put it on my shoulders, and it was just amazing. Like, I, I, I welled up. I almost broke into tears because as soon as that blanket hit my shoulders, just this energy just circulated right down through me, hit the floor, and came back up. And it was just this amazing experience um, that just inspired me to think about the work and to think about that traditional weaving. Um, we got the weaving. The Chilkat style is, is more uh, prominent on, on the northern northwest coast. So the Haida people use it, the Shimshan people and the Tingle people use it. Um, and it's a, a specific form of weaving to that, to that specific area. But through a series of wars, marriages, trades, potlatches, um, the Chilkat iconography has, has, has woven its way down into the southern coasts. Um, but it is a, a, it is an iconography or a piece of regalia that does denounce your status, uh, that does show your status. And my great-great-grandfather, Chief Bile was, was was high in status on the Northwest Coast. He was widely respected um, by every, every, every peoples along the Northwest Coast. Uh, there was a story I heard, uh, I need to confirm it, um, but I heard that when he passed away in the late 60s, that the Canadian government did a military flyby at Bar Reserve to pay respect to him, because that's how respect that he was, but not only our people, um, but by the colonial government as well. And so this notion of status and how the blanket came into my family, the blanket came into my family um, through an arranged political marriage between the uh, Mungo Martin family. And Mungo Martin was a very important Kwakwaka'u carver on the Northwest Coast. Um, he has a couple poles in the Totem area in Stanley Park. Um, the, uh, the big tall pole that's out by uh, Vanny Park, that's his. He's got poles in, in Europe as well. Um, a highly respected um, cultural maker and a very important family. And he approached my great-great-grandfather, uh, again, recognizing the importance of, of my family, and said, we need to come together to preserve our culture. Um, we need to come together um, and, and marry the two families together. Um, but it was a political marriage. There was no actual physical marriage involved. Um, but through that, I call it a dowry because I don't know how else to describe it. Um, the Martin family gave my family their Chilkat regalia. Um, and that was a status symbol and a status update um, <clears throat> for um, my people and for my family. And that's what inspired this series here called the Chilkat series, and this is status update. And I really wanted to try and think about it in terms of our modern society and how we utilize various modes of status um, within our society through social media. You know, we're able to, you know, I look at my great-grandfather grandfa who had this immense practice and this immense stature to him. Um, but here I am going on Facebook posting photos of my daughter and my food. <laughs> and so I really wanted to try and figure out how we go from that importance to that importance. And this is what this series is really kind of um, exploring. So this is the Chilkat series. Uh, we got Tweet Blast, uh, Digital Native, uh, Angry Birds, because I was playing Angry Birds like crazy, so I just decided to paint a painting called Angry Birds. Um, and Trending. Uh, these are the latest ones that I've done. This is Photobomb. So I've got all these little guys popping up and photobombing the Hanukkah. This is Idle and More, uh, painted in response and support of the Idle and More movement. This is Potlatch Shades Gray. <laughs> I was actually going to try and paint 50 different shades of gray, but I got at six, and I'm like, I'm not going any further than six right now. <laughs> This is the selfie series, and those last ones I just showed you in this series was done for my, 
uh, my first solo show in Montreal at a gallery called Art Mirror. Um, this is the selfie series, again, trying to explore how we place importance on ourselves through social media. And there's this phenomenon called the selfie. So you hold your phone like this and take a photo and post it on Instagram. Um, so we got shameless selfie at the bottom, selfie, do you want to see my status card, and selfie 2013. Challenging the authority of preservation and consumption. Uh, this is the longing series, and that's my, uh, my stepfather Jack right there. Uh, we were going through these piles of discarded cedar um, on a log home development uh, site um, on my reserve um, in, in Campbell River. Uh, looking for usable bits of cedar for my mom to use for her basket tree or whatever she wanted to do with. Because we recognize that, you know, we have all these logs that this company is going down into our unseceded territories, cutting them down, bringing them back to our traditional territory, stripping them down, and making all these elaborate log homes. And they're tearing them back down and they're shipping them off around the world to the people who can afford them. Um, but there's all this waste on the site. There's sawdust, there's cedar bark, there's little bits of wood that don't get used for the log homes. And... Jack and I are going through these piles of wood, and he holds up these two pieces. And he said, Sonny, don't these look like masks? And I said, yeah, Jack, you're right. These do look like masks. And he says, I bet you could do something interesting with these. And I said, I bet you're right. <laughs> and so I did. And what I did is I, I, is I mounted these on um, traditional, not traditional, but museum quality mask mounts. So I approached the Museum of Anthropology and I said, Do you, can you recommend someone to me that could make me some mask mounts? And I mounted 31 of these masks that I rescued, reclaimed um, from this log home development site. And they had sat in my studio for um, about five years before I did this show called Longing in West Vancouver. And I had no idea what I was going to be doing at that time. I was just collecting them. Every time I go back home, I just grab more and more and more. So my studio smelled like glorious cedar, but also beans <laughs> from the burrito place that was underneath me. So it was a really neat, <laughs> neat smell, just right here on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, so I, I had these things sitting in my studio, and I thought about augmenting them, adding things to them, sanding them down, painting them. But as I, as I started to look at them, I just started to just appreciate the fact that they were faces, and that they, were, they were telling me a story, and that the the kind of poetics that the chainsaw paired with the, the, the growth rings were, were telling me the story, this, this, this image of a, of, a, of a face or a person or a personality was coming out of these works. <clears throat> and that spawned into this other series um, that I did where I wanted to explore the authenticity of, nor uh, of who is an indigenous person, indigenous person and who is an indigenous artist. And so I started thinking about challenging those authorities. And to me, especially in, in, in Vancouver and the Northwest Coast, the authorities of who is an indigenous artist and an indigenous person um, is the anthropology museums, is the First Nations commercial galleries here in Vancouver, and is the tourist traps, as I call them, um, where you can go down and you can buy a pair of moccasins and your dream catcher, and you can say, I got an Indian thing from Canada. It's awesome. Um, I installed this, this shot, so I installed the guy up here in the corner, number 13. Um, and before I called the series Longing, the series was going to be called Faceless. And to me, it was, I was politicizing the work through the title by thinking about how um, First Nations people in Canada have been or are, are faceless through our, our contemporary society. Um, but when I installed number 13 in the Museum of Anthropology, and it was up there for a month and a half, so it is a little, little intervention that was there. Um, I made these little title cards from like the numbers for them and everything. Um, and when I stepped back to look at it and the, to allow my friend Eric Dice, who, who's the photographer for this, for this series, I stepped back and I just, I just looked up at number 13 and I just, I just noticed the way that I placed the head and the way that the light was catching it that he was longing for something. He was missing something in his life. And I just kind of looked at what he was looking at and he was looking at all the other artifacts in those display cases. And I started placing these emotions onto number 13, thinking about, well, I could have been that mask. I could have been that rattle. I could have been that basket. I could have been that feast bowl. But through a series of weird fates, I became garbage. I have no purpose in life. I'm not art. I'm not culture. I'm just waste. But for me, mounting them on those museum quality standards and placing them in these situations I gave them the purpose of being culture and the purpose of being objects of appreciation. 
This is a shot called the Equinox Gallery, which I wanted to do to um, investigate that First Nations bubble of authenticity in, 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 in Vancouver and, and in Seattle and wherever else that has these kind of unique First Nations galleries. Uh, this was installed uh, in a show. It wasn't in the show, but it was just installed for the photograph um, at a show. I think it was called uh, The Inside Passage or Past or Present. I can't remember which one it was. Um, but it was this collector, Don Ellis, that had all of his objects from his own personal collection that he's been collecting over the years. These uh, post, uh, post 20th, uh, post 19, or 1900s, uh, early, late 1800s uh, objects from my culture. And so I placed them in these, um, by these Ulican dishes and these paddles on the wall. The Ulican dishes were, were really interesting. These ones right here, let's not talk about my work for a second, but these guys right here. Um, they're, they're still Ulican grease embedded in the wood. And so when the, the pieces warmed up during the day, when the lights were on it, you can actually see the grease come out of the wood, which is really, really beautiful. Oops, I hope I didn't laser somebody there. <laughs> um, this is Robert's Gallery and Gifts. <laughs> Too bad that my cousin didn't come by today to see this, because this is her shop. Um, and I wanted to investigate that tourist culture about how we have these galleries across Canada. It doesn't matter if you're in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg. We're, we're going to have one of these shops that, that peddles these, these objects to people, um, that they can go in there and they can think that they're getting this unique object of, of culture, but they're actually walking away with a mass-produced item that may or may not have been made in China. Um, so I, I, I put the mask in the shop, and I put them there and took the photograph. When I was giving, this present, when I was giving a presentation out at Bishop's University last winter, um, there, was a, there was a student there who was from North Vancouver, and he's talking to me about my work, he was talking about my paintings, asking these questions about them, and said, oh, by the way, that, that shop, Robert's Gallery and Gifts, that's on the corner of Granville and something, right? Like, that's where it is? Oh, it's in Gastown? And I'm like, actually, no, it's in Steveston. It's like the complete opposite end of town. So what I thought interesting there was that it really hit home that he said that to me. Like, he thought this was a gallery that was somewhere else in the city, which really kind of made it clear to me that this work was really just kind of speaking to the notion that every time you go into one of these shops, you're always going to find the same thing. I think I'm running out of time here pretty quick, um, <clears throat> but I'm coming up to the end. This is the series that I'm working on right now. It's called The Happiest Future, and it's really exploring this hidden history um, in Canada. Uh, and these are direct quotes uh, from Duncan Campbell Scott, who was Canada's um, head of the Department of Indian Affairs from 1913 to 1932, I think it was. He was also a celebrated Canadian poet. He wrote a lot. Uh, he rom romanticized the Indian a lot through his poetry and through his work, uh, but he was very oppressive towards them in his, in his day job. Um, his mandate was assimilation. Um, so he says, the happiest future for the Indian race is absorption into the general population. This is the policy of our government. What I find interesting there with this direct quote and thinking about how the current government is treating the indigenous people, I could take out Duncan Campbell Scott's name and place Stephen Harper. I can go back to the 60s during the white paper incident and place in um, Jean Chrétien's name because he was the head of the Department of Indian Affairs back then. Um, so it's interesting to see that this, this notion of propaganda or assimilation has been produced in Canada, but not in a, in, in a visual way. And that's what this series is really trying to investigate through me is I really want to try and get to the root of the hate in Canada against the in, in indigenous people, the bigotry that is out there. And I really want to figure it out because I'm perplexed by it. Because we as Canadians feel we live in a utopia. We feel that we are just, we are united, we're tolerant, we're welcoming of all people. We're not. You know, this is a country that's not based on that. Uh, you know, you can think about what's going on in Quebec right now. This is the exact same thing. They're thinking about, you know, banning um, objects of, of religion um, through this notion of, of assimilation, essentially. Um, so I found it really interesting that, you know, we have these perceptions of ourselves as Canadians, but we have the perceptions of hate against Indigenous people. And it really came about for me by scrolling through different media sites like CBC, The Globe and Mail, whatever it may be, blog posts, um, that talk about stories of Indigenous people in Canada, whether they be positive or whether they be negative, whether it's the Admamor movements or whatever. Um, there's always this element of hate that comes up. And it's, it's an element of hate that sometimes is this very on the surface and a very gut reaction to, oh, we pay your taxes, you should just shut up. You know? um, you're just a dirty Indian, you know, assimilate, get with the rest of society. You, know, you got your free house, you, know, you got your free house, you got your free land, you get your health care taken care of. You know, these are all things that I see on these websites. 
by other Canadians, and I really want to try and figure out where this comes from. And for me, it is the words of Duncan Campbell Scott that has perpetuated this hate. And so this series is really starting to think about propaganda and how, at some point in Canada's history, this visual propaganda must have been populated out there to spread the intolerance and to spread the bigotry. This is a shot of it uh, in Toronto right now. Uh, it's, it's up on a show called Ghost Dance. Um, this curated by Steve Loft. Um, so they're, they're sort of big. They're 18 by 36, and I installed them uh, in a line there. And this is called uh, Selective History, and this is another uh, Duncan Campbell Scott quote. Uh, hopefully I can read it from here. Uh, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think it is a matter of fact that we uh, can, ought to continuously protect a class of people who are able to stand alone. Our objective is to continue until there's not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body, body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department that is the object of this bill. This is assimilation, this is segregation, this is apartheid, this is Canada's history, and we don't learn it in school. This is information that I had to seek out while being here at Emily Carr and after leaving school. Um, this is information that's hidden from us. This is information that really challenges the fabric of, can of Canada's identity, of being tolerant and just. And I present it to you in such a way that I'm hopefully challenging people to step up to that notion of tolerance and understanding and utopia, to learn about Canada's history and understand it and help the Indigenous people um, through the issues of colonization and not belittle them anymore, not berate them. Um, and I called it selective history because through this quote, Duncan Campbell Scott is saying there's an Indian problem. In the white paper, they were saying there was an Indian problem. Uh, in the omnibus budget bill that Stephen Harper passed, there is an Indian problem. It's not an Indian problem, it's a selective history problem. On the bottom here? Right there? Oh, that's his, that's his, his name, Duncan Campbell Scott, uh, head of the Department of Indian Affairs, 1913-1932. Uh, uh, these quotes I got from Wikipedia, they're out there, you can find them online. <clears throat> these are two pieces within that series as well. We have uh, Chief Speaker and Eleven Nations. This is a direct quote from our Prime Minister Stephen Harper in 2009 at the G8 and G20 conference in Philadelphia. We also have no history of colonialism. So we have all the things that many people admire about great powers, but none of the things that threaten or bother people. So his words in my piece are crossing out First Nations, Aboriginal, Native Indian. I, sometimes I don't have any words after I read that quote because this is Stephen Harper. He, he, he prides himself on being one of the most history, knowledgeable person, people of, history, of Canadian history. Um, but he says these words and it's just like, are you serious? You actually said these things? A couple days later, after he, the quote hit the news and people were tweeting about it and blogging about it, um, he comes up and says, oh, I didn't mean, uh, I meant that we don't have any external history of colonization. So we don't go to somewhere like the Philippines and take them over. As in, he didn't say the Philippines, I just say it as an example. Um, the bottom one is called Eleven Nations. And this is a, a quote from Polly Mawa, who is now the premier of Quebec. Um, and she's in the news a lot recently. Um, it, is it is the responsibility of everyone that wishes to call Quebec their home to learn and assimilate the local culture and not replace it with their own. And her words cross out the 11 nations, the 11 traditional First Nations of what we now call Quebec. I know we're running out of time, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, this is Product Res. Um, this is a piece that I did in 2011-2012. Uh, uh, first for a show called Decolonize Me that's now touring around the country. Um, it's just, it's taking on this, this identity of consumption culture through the red campaign that uh, Apple, Starbucks, Bono has, Gap, have adopted. You go out, you spend $35 on a t-shirt, 35 cents of that goes to help people in Africa with AIDS. What I found interesting is that we will go out of our way to consume to help people but we will continually ignore the people in our own backyard. And so that, that's what these pieces uh, represent to me. This is uh, There is Hope If We Rise, number one and two, um, Rise and Round Dance. And this again was produced um, for a show, the Burnaby Art Gallery, the artist poster show um, that I was part of. And the Burnaby Art Gallery commissioned me to do these works. 
And uh, it was inspired by the Idle No More movement. So the gallery wanted to produce these posters um, to hand out for um, Idle No More round dances, information sessions, teach-ins. Um, and I, I developed 12 of them that have the, the common phrases from within the movement. There's rise, round dance, never idle, idle no more, idle no more, uh, learn, teach, challenge stereotypes, lead, confront, resist, decolonize. And they all have the four little old boys on the bottom to pay respect to the four founding women of the Idle No More movement. Um, but it's done in this kind of propaganda series style. And I was influenced by Shepard Ferry's um, hope poster that he did for Obama um, during his first presiden presidential campaign. And this is my latest piece here. Um, this is called Lila's Desk. And this is a story about my grandmother's first day of high school. Um, my grandmother was given the great honor to be allowed to continue on to high school after grade eight. Up until then, uh, it was illegal for First Nations people to attend school after the, uh, after the eighth grade. Um, they were either subjugated to a residential school or an Indian day school. An Indian day school is a residential school without the state. Uh, if you were a man or a boy at, the, at, a, at a resident school or day school, you were taught to be a laborer. If you're a woman, you were taught to be a housewife. Um, as a funny kind of side story to this, I remember when I, was, when I finished grade eight, I was in junior high at the time, it was my first year of junior high, and my grandfather was still alive. And he says to me, and he, he, ra he helped raise me, and he says to me, I'm so proud of you for, for continuing on and going into grade nine. You have no idea how, how proud I am of you. And I just looked up and said, well, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's grade nine. Like, I still have four more years. Like, what's going on? <laughs> and he told me, like, I, I just, I, I dropped out. I became a pool shark, and then I eventually became a fisherman. And he was one of the youngest uh, commercial fishing captains uh, in British Columbia uh, for the BC Packers. Um, and I just thought he had enough of school, you know, because that's, that's what I heard of. Like, when you drop out of school, you just had enough. You don't need to go anymore, whatever. Um, and for me, like, it was just, it was so, so, such of a small achievement, grade eight, um, that it didn't really make sense to me at the time, but I found that he was not legally allowed to go to school. So a great, he was older than my grandmother, so he, he, he stopped going, he just had to stop, it was done, he was, he's done. Um, anyways, so for this piece, my grandmother was allowed to go to school. So in the late 1930s, early 1940s, they changed the law within the Indian Act to allow students to continue on to high school if they wished. Um, what my grand, and she tells me this story a lot, what I found out through the story is that when she started going to school is that she was super far behind. They didn't really teach her anything. She didn't really know how to read all that well. She could not write very much. Um, she barely knew arithmetic. Um, but she prevailed. She went on. She, she, she graduated. She made it to grade 12. Um, but on her first day of high school, of grade 9, a boy named Peter McFedrin plopped the bar of soap on her desk and said, you're just a dirty Indian. They had a good laugh with his friends, and that's it. And it's, it's a sad story because, you know, this is a story that can resonate to a lot of people in this room and to a lot of people within the, the, the residential school system because this is, this is probably not a singular incident, you know. Um, and it's important that I tell this story because it really gives a human face to the issues. And that's essentially what I want to do with my work. So I want to give the issues of colonization a human face because we are humans. You know, we, we were just treated that we, we were just treated not like humans. Um, and, that's, and this is what this piece is about. So it's a reclaimed... 1930s school desk that I found on Craigslist. Uh, I refurbished it, I stripped it down, I sent it off all the crayon marks from various generations of kids playing on it, um, refinished it, and I copper leafed uh, the cast iron bottom parts and presented it as a story about my grandmother's first day. And I found um, the exact bar of soap on eBay um, called Life Boy. And she, this is the soap that she told me about. He plopped down a bar of Life Boy soap on my desk. You know, she remembers the details so clearly and it, it's eerie, it's so scary. You know, this is, this is a story that stuck with her, that affected her her entire life. You know, and this is a story that I, I'm constantly told and I wanna keep telling the story to, to you and to my daughter to, to, to remember, you know. <clears throat> so to lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> um, this is just some recent stuff that I've done recently and I'm almost finished my, my presentation. This is Tag. 
Um, this is at the corner of Seymour and Pacific. It just got installed yesterday. It's my, my second public art piece. Um, and it kind of lays claim to Vancouver through an indigenous discourse by using the iconography um, from my people uh, and the various peoples in the, north, uh, the, the lower mainland. Uh, and tag references graffiti culture. Um, on the off-ramp, on the Seymour off-ramp on the Granville Bridge, there was all this graffiti on there that had been collecting over the years. Um, but the developer washed it out because they didn't want to have that stuff in front of the people's eyes when they walk out of their houses in the, every morning. Um, and so I paid respect to that graffiti and to that artwork that was there by creating this piece called Tag. Um, and I'm really excited that I was able to see it um, finally installed. It's, uh, each pen, there's five panels in, in total and they're all uh, f around four by four, four foot by four foot. And so it's nice to actually see them uh, in real life because I was just looking at them super small on my, on my computer screen when I was making them. So it's really cool to have them out there. And then a last uh, public art piece that I've done recently, uh, this was from a couple years ago for Vancouver's 125th anniversary. Um, it's Indigenous Trail and Wagon Road. So if you're going along Kingsway, starting at Manning Kingsway all the way to Boundary, um, you will see these signs about every two or three blocks. Um, and it's based on a story I heard that Kingsway was, um, was, was created uh, from the wagon road that the settlers used. And the wagon road was created from the indigenous trail that the indigenous people used that connected people uh, around Coquitlam all the way down to uh, where we are now. Um, so this is paying uh, respect to the indigenous peoples in the lower mainland um, to give them a voice in Vancouver's colonial um, anniversary. And that's it. I thank you for your time. If you have any questions. Thank you.